Hey beautiful, welcome to Unapologetic at 50. I am your host, Sharon Fields. This is an uncapped community discussing real life issues. In your 50s, you have the right to say, I have no time for games. Never regret in the past or apologizing for wanting a better future. Join me and special guests as we discuss topics and provide tools to navigate our midlife challenges. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I missed you guys so much. It has been a while since I have been with you. There's just been so many things that's been going on, but I will tell you about that later. I don't want to waste any time because today I have two fabulous women with us. They are going to bless you with some great information. If you do not know, this is actually Mental Health Month. So it is a great thing that we have them with us today and I have their book and look you know I've been reading y'all y'all see all these little tabs I got up in there Mm -hmm. I started reading this I was like don't bother me don't bother me don't (laughs) bother me (laughs) so I am glad that they are with us today the name of the book is the anxiety sisters survival guide you're gonna want this You definitely are going to want this. There were so many things in here that helped me to have a better understanding regarding some of the things that was happening in my life, happening with my friends. We are 50 plus and fabulous. So you may be dealing with menopause. This just touches on everything. So I don't want to continue to talk because you know I could do that very well. You know I love you. You know I appreciate you. I'm glad you're here. If you and when you are viewing this, make sure you grab a friend because they're not going to want to miss this either. So I am going to go ahead and introduce the ladies. So I have with me and for us today, Abby Greenberg, and I have Maggie Sarachek, like Sarah Check. Gotcha. Thank you so much for that. So we want to welcome you. I want to welcome you. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining us today. Hey, we're delighted to be here. And just like a minute ago, I was thinking, I don't understand. There is just no way this is unapologetically 50. There's no way she's. Yes, it is. (laughs) I was like, maybe she's like 33, 34. (laughs) I was like, is she standing in? (laughs) I will be celebrating my 54th birthday in August. So let me tell you. August what? 13. Why would you die? What? See, that's what I'm talking Leo. about. Leo, Leo, Leo. Yes. <laughs> I celebrate the whole month. I actually start at the end of July and I'm going to work my way through just because it's my month. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. All right. So tell us a little bit about yourselves, lady, whichever way you want to go. Whoever okay. wants to start first. Well, A comes before M, so I'll be alphabetically first. All right. (laughs) I'm the younger of the two of us by six (laughs) weeks. (laughs) So we can't really go by age because we're the same age. So I'm abs. And first and foremost, I identify myself as an anxiety sister. I have been dealing with some form of anxiety or another since I'm I can remember five years old, maybe even before that, but my memory only goes back to five. So I've had different anxiety disorders my entire life. Obsessive compulsive disorder is one of my diagnoses, panic disorder, illness anxiety disorder. I got a whole list. So I'm an expert in suffering from anxiety. I think I have the patent on it. I met my best friend and anxiety sister and soulmate Maggie when I was in college back in the 80s when people didn't talk about mental health. Mm hmm. So we didn't use the A word or the D word for depression or there were no no one had conversations about mental health back then. So Mags and I suffered in silence. And actually, it wasn't even that we were so silent. It was more that we didn't really understand that what we were feeling was anxiety because Mm -hmm. our symptoms were so physical. And I'll let Maggie tell you about her symptoms, but mine, I had the whole cardiac thing going on. I was, you know, out of breath and I had dizziness and my heart was racing and I felt like my fingers were tingly and I just, it was like a Bayer aspirin commercial. So I just figured I had some bad heart. I didn't think it was anxiety. That wasn't where my mind went. So meeting Maggie definitely saved my life because 
even though I've done every single one of the techniques that we talk about in our book, and there's like 200 of them. <laughs> so even though, even though I tried all of those things and many, many of them have been incredibly helpful and I still do them to this day, the most helpful thing in my entire anxiety journey was connecting with Maggie, having a person who's not judgmental, who says, I feel you, I totally get it. I feel it too. I understand. Yes, that happened to me. Oh my God, you're not alone. All that, what has been the most healing part of my anxiety journey. So that's why we, I think I did the same for her on some level. So we decided to start a community called the Anxiety Sisters, where women and men could come together and talk about the real experience of anxiety, the real experience of depression, what it feels like to struggle with your mental health so that we can all be non-judgmental and say to each other, yeah, I get it. I, yeah. I totally understand me too. So my background professionally is I have a few graduate degrees. I was a communication professor for 26 years, but when I turned 50, and when Mags turned 50, which was the same year, we decided we were going to leave our full-time careers behind and focus 100% on developing this community and really changing the mental health conversation. So that's what we've awesome. been at. That is awesome. Wow. Thank We need it. And you said something, you said there weren't any conversations about it, you know, suffering and silence. And in my community, in the African-American community, Latino community, I'm going to say minority community, it was always like that whole thing where, you know, certain things are supposed to stay in the home. Certain things aren't supposed to be out there for the public. So that causes us to suffer in silence as well. So I'm glad that you did bring that up. Yeah, mm -hmm. that we have to have the conversations to get better. Right. Absolutely. And not yeah. feel so alone. Support. Because, Support systems. Yeah. Because, you know, we're all human. Yes. So we all experience anxiety sometimes. Even if you don't know that it's anxiety. And that's something that we're going to touch bases on because you also spoke about the cardiac part. Mm -hmm. And that is something that goes hand in hand with anxiety, correct? You start to sweat, you get palpitation, short of breath, right? I'll tell you because I recently had an episode, but I'll tell you about that after mm -hmm. Mags, mm -hmm. after you tell us about you and introduce yourself. So like Abby said, I'm an anxiety sister and I'm a social worker by training. And my symptoms tend to be less cardiac and more stomach related. Okay. I used to think I just wouldn't be feeling like I had the stomach flu every day. We also know that there are some people who get rashes and itching as part of their symptoms. Like anything your body burping and farting, I hope that's okay to say, but anything your body can do, anxiety can really make happen. So people have all sorts of weird symptoms, numbness and feeling outside their bodies. You know, all of those things can be symptoms of anxiety. And in my professional life, I was lucky enough to work in a high school in New York City with students from America, but also all over the world and just about every culture, both here in America and, and all over the world. And I can definitely say that mental health in some communities, there was less of a conversation, but also different traditional ways of dealing with mental health, or people didn't really understand the idea of a social worker, but they had their own traditions in place of people, whether religious leader or, you know, some sort of spiritual leader, right. some sort of spiritual person in their community. You know, so I'd often ask people like, well, if you're feeling bad, who do you talk to? Uh -huh. Like, who would you talk to back home? And who do you talk to here? And you know, so I think a lot of cultures have a lot to teach us. They have a really rich history of different ways of dealing with mental health that we don't necessarily have, you know, but definitely the conversation is an important one to have in, in a lot of different ways. Absolutely. You know, there are cultures also that make people feel bad about, you know, dealing or living, suffering with mental illness. So that's another reason why yeah. people have a tendency of being quiet because they are, you know, it's shunned or they're looked at like, no, you don't need to be around them as if it's something that you can catch. Again, these conversations are definitely needed. So I want to thank you ladies for stepping up to the forefront and doing exactly what it is that you do. So let's talk more about mm -hmm. your book. When did you actually write the book? Because when I started reading, I didn't get into all of that. I just started going for it. Okay. So when did you write the book? 
we believe it or not, we started writing the book in 2010. Okay. <laughs> so it was a very long project. <laughs> uh, we started writing the book we needed in yes, our own yeah. struggle because, you know, we're book people. So we said, all right, we're going to go and we will find the book that will help us manage our anxiety. Once we figured out that it was anxiety, let's, mm-hmm, let's mm-hmm. get a book. And, you know, I had a panic attack at Barnes and Noble from reading the titles of some of those books because wow. they were like scary. And then there were these big, thick workbooks and there was a lot of shoulds going on. I mean, Mm. everything I was reading, you know, I kept saying to Maggie, it says I have to eat these things and I have to give up sugar. And it was like all the stuff. And I said, I don't know if I can do any of that. I can barely get out of my bed. So, you know, each other, we need to write the book that's not there for us. We need a non-prescriptive, non-judgmental, no shooting on anybody kind of book. Right. That we recognize that one size doesn't fit all, that people experience anxiety in so many ways. I mean, even just me and Mags, we experience it completely differently. Everybody has their own special brand of anxiety, whatever it is in their bodies and in their in their lives. And so we wanted to write the book that everybody could find something for themselves in. And you did exactly that. The book, people will definitely be able to relate to. They will be able to see some of the things that they have gone through in this book. You know, if not that somebody that they love, that they're close to, that they are a support system for, they'll see it in this book as Mm -hmm. well and say, hey, so I'm not crazy. Hey, Mm -hmm. you know, this is something that I can talk to somebody about because it's clear right here that other people are going through the same thing. I'm sorry, Mags, were you going to say something? No, I was just going to say we started working on this whole idea in 2010, as Ab said, but believe it or not, we wrote this book, our publisher's Penguin Random House and a division called Tarsher, and we got our book contract. And so we thought, okay, we're going to go and we're going to work together and, you know, write. But we got our book contract right before a little thing called the worldwide pandemic, Mm. right before the coronavirus, (laughs) literally like a couple of weeks before. And so we really wrote this book when we were already cooped up in our houses when that time of the pandemic, when we really couldn't leave much. And we did it over the phone. Wow. Day, we spent <laughs> the entire day over the phone. We were right convinced here. one of us was going to get ill and possibly not make it. So we felt like we had to rush. We had to get it out there. Yeah, this was the <laughs> very beginning. We were like, so we work seven days a week, just like writing, writing, writing. Cause you know, we're like, okay, we're both anxiety sisters. One of us is going to get this virus and one of us is going to get really sick. This was pre mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, shots and everything. And so we were like, we might as well just work seven days a week. So <laughs> we don't leave the other person with it. And we would and- do things like send each other emails saying, you know, if anything happens to me, don't forget to put this in. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I am thankful that both of you are still here. I'm thankful that you were able to get it done. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about, you mentioned brain chemistry, and there's a couple of places throughout the book that you're talking about neurotransmitters. And if you can explain what a neurotransmitter is and how it coincides with anxiety, depression. Sure. Well, neurotransmitters are basically their chemical messengers in your nervous system. So we have a lot of neurotransmitters, but the ones that we tend to target with, let's say, medication for anxiety and depression would be serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Those are sort of the big three in the mental health world. But there are many. And with the job of those neurotransmitters as a team is to regulate processes in our body like libido, our sex drive to regulate blood pressure, our temperature, to regulate our moods, to regulate our metabolisms, all the things, the systems in our body. Mm -hmm. So the neurotransmitter's job is to jump from nerve cell to nerve cell and let everybody know what's doing. And the messages are supposed to run nice and smoothly. So everything runs and hums. But if you're an anxiety sister, your transmitters might not be in balance. There might be not enough of it available to uplift your mood or to keep your mood steady. So we know there is a connection between particularly serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, and our mood. And that's why they call the drugs that that we call antidepressants are their classes serotonin, their SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So they target the receptors for serotonin in the brain. 
And what we're talking about, what most people would probably know or relate to is the dopamine, right? Because you hear people all the time that they're talking about the dopamine is the happy. It's the reward one. Yeah. It's the one that's in charge of our reward centers. So it's actually very involved in things like addiction. Mm. And Mags is more of a dopamine expert than I am. I'm more of a serotonin expert. Yeah. Mags, what do you know about that? <laughs> no, I mean, you know, dopam- people often say you get a dopamine hit from certain things, right? I mean, that's the common jargon. And that could be, you know, from exercise, right? I mean, not me, but other, but Abby does. It could be from chocolate. That's me. But, you know, obviously it's also from other activities, both positive and not so, and things that ultimately end up being destructive. It's like that short term hit, you know, because it's a very short term. So that is for anxiety. Usually the neurotransmitters that are more targeted are what Abby was saying, which is the serotonin or the norepinephrine. Yeah. Those two are more targeted just for the anxiety. So So now the serotonin is what you hear again, a lot of people saying that their serotonin is low. Is there ever a situation when the serotonin is high and that causes anxiety or no, it's when it's low? There's kind of a misunderstanding going around about serotonin levels. First of all, I'll tell you something interesting. 95% of your serotonin is made in your gut. Well, they, I, I've been reading that gut yeah. to brain. Yeah. Right? yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. brain actually yeah. produces more serotonin than your penthouse brain does. Gotcha. The only 5% or so of our serotonin is made up here upstairs. So people find that really interesting. Serotonin, it's not that we have too little or too much of it. It's that we need to have a certain amount available mm. in the synapses between our nerve cells. In other words, it needs to be in a specific place at a specific time. We all have serotonin. We all produce serotonin. It's a question of if our receptors are working properly and we're able to have it available for use in our brain. So it's kind of a very tricky, fine line. But no, we're not trying to raise our serotonin Mm. levels. We're trying to make it more available to the brain. Right. Because once it gets absorbed into the brain in certain ways, it's not as useful. It's like as it is between the synapses. So it's like it's weird kind of thing with serotonin. It's kind of being in the right place at the right time. And the synapses is like the triggers or something, right? It's the spaces in between your nerve cells. Okay. So when somebody is having... Go ahead. That's where the communication happens. Neurotransmitters do their thing in the synapses. If somebody is having like a seizure or something like that, or migraines, right? That it's misfiring or something like that. It can also affect things in the synapse. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's get the hormones. So I did not know that anxiety or... Like out of the dealing with anxiety or feeling anxious could be a part of menopause. I did not know that. Now, once I read this, I was like, that makes sense because I had an episode of my own. Now, my situation is a little different because I don't have a baseline because I had a hysterectomy, right? So, and I don't have like hot flashes during the day. I do have some night sweats or whatever. But what I noticed with my body was totally different, like drier skin. Mm-hmm. You know, my hair in certain places is getting a little thinner. My vision is, you know, a little bit blurrier, drier eyes. So drier skin, drier eyes as well. So I was like, well, I think that this is a part of menopause. But then I had anxiety attack. And I was actually talking to a client on the phone, but it just came out of nowhere. So I don't know what the trigger was or anything, but my heart started racing and I was trying to hold on because I was feeling a little lightheaded too. And I didn't want to hang up on the client. So I had a headset. I made my way down to the floor. They didn't know none of this was going on. So I'm pretty good. (laughs) Made my way down to the floor and started breathing exercises. Right. I started doing breathing exercises to try to get myself together. And finally I did. And it passed. And I was like, wow, what was that? I got concerned because I had open heart surgery. I was born with a congenital heart disease. So I didn't know, like, wait, what is going on here? The next time I was driving to Virginia, I love to drive. I'll drive up, over, under. I just love to get in the car and go. And I had to cross the Chesapeake. Bay Bridge. I thought I was going to die. 
it was like everything got so tight. I couldn't breathe. I was sweating. My heart was pounding. And I was just like, I'm never, ever going to make it over this bridge. And I didn't understand why, because I like to drive. But then I thought about it. The bird was right beside my car window. That's how high we were on that bridge. So something in reference to the height Mm -hmm. in my body or something just got triggered. And I just prayed. I prayed the whole way there. I held on. It was like I was having muscle spasms or something because I was holding on to the wheel so tight. I finally made it across. And I was like, if you stop now, you'll never make it. So I just... Again, with the breathing techniques and I continued to drive and I got there and then I got there and I said, if I have to go back across that bridge, I'm going to have to pay somebody. Somebody's going to have to drive me across the bridge, take my car, you know, to the other side and we would go from there. But reading this made me say, Sharon, it's okay. You know what I'm saying? There's nothing wrong with your brain in reference to you thinking that you had an anxiety attack because you actually did. Yeah. I mean, what you've reported to us, we hear it hundreds of times a week. I mean, you're a very unique and amazing person, but your experience of anxiety is not so unique. We've all had those moments where out of the blue sky, suddenly we're feeling really frightened. Yeah. Like we're running for our lives. And what you were experiencing when your muscles were clenched and you were squeezing the wheel of the car, your body was in fight, flight, or freeze. Your brain was saying, we're in danger. Even though it wasn't true, that was what your brain was saying and your body was responding accordingly. Yeah, I don't think that people should be that high up in the air, though, if you're not in a plane (laughs) or something. (laughs) To see that bird next to me. (laughs) And I'm like, where are you going? (laughs) (laughs) That's a good point, actually. But okay, tell us a little bit about that menopause and anxiety. Really, I mean, something that Abby knows a lot about in terms of like, she's studied this a lot, but one of the things she tells me that I've always found really interesting is that there's some connection between estrogen and serotonin. Gotcha. And so that I think what Abby, you've told me is that they don't really know the entire connection yet, but somehow, you know, during menopause, obviously- we, uh-huh. our estrogen goes down and down and there's some connection with serotonin levels going down too. And so that in itself is one thing that I found really interesting about thinking about menopause and women getting more anxiety. We know that end times in a woman's life where her hormones are in flux. So let's say Mm -hmm. puberty and pregnancy and postpartum and menopause, perimenopause, all those times when our hormones, our estrogen and our progesterone are going all crazy and our estrogen levels are really starting to plummet. We know that has a connection, as Maggie said, with the availability of serotonin to our brain. So we know that there's a connection there. And Mm -hmm. you talk about the dryness. Well, estrogen is our body's lubricant. Right. So when we don't have estrogen and when it's going downhill, so even though we're unapologetic in 50, we need to moisturize. Yeah. <laughs> because we're unapologetic but dry. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> because true. estrogen is what lubricates our joints and it also helps lubricate our eyes, like you said, and our yeah. skin, everything else. So if you're feeling dry, that's definitely estrogen showing you how important it was to have it wow. when we were more youthful. That was one of the nice things that estrogen did for us. But it also is connected with serotonin. And also just when our hormones aren't balanced. Just when even if we have a fine amount of estrogen, but it's not balanced with, let's say, our testosterone, because we all women and men need both hormones. So if we're not in the right balance, that can cause anxiety. Anything can throw your body into fight or flight. Right. And it doesn't have to make any sense to anything but your brain, to the part of your brain called the amygdala. That's where it makes sense. It may not make sense anywhere else. You may say, what? Why is my heart thudding? I'm talking to a client. This makes no right. sense. <laughs> but your brain, your amygdala is saying, aha, I'm not feeling any estrogen. So it must be under attack. Yeah. I'm like, get it together with the, what's the word again? <laughs> like, can you send me a message first so I could kind of get myself together? It, it is sending you a message. Maybe not yeah. one we always want to hear, but it's, right. it's sending a very clear message. The message is get ready to run or fight for your (laughs) life. So we were talking about menopause and you were explaining in reference to estrogen and everything that's happening with the body. So I want to thank you for that because that was something that I wasn't aware of. So thank you for that. And I'm sure that the listeners are glad to know that too. Do you recommend 
them like, I don't know, getting that estrogen levels checked or something, or that has nothing to do. For some people like myself, having too little estrogen in the body was actually very bad for my body okay. because I went through menopause very early. Okay. I went through to my thirties. And so I was without estrogen for a really long period of time. And it gave me terrible symptoms like paralyzing muscle aches and joint pain and not just the hormonal symptoms, but really right. debilitating symptoms where I couldn't do anything. I couldn't move. So I had all my levels tested and they decided that I was a very good candidate for hormone replacement therapy. Not everybody is. That's right. something where you have to go through the tests and you have to, you know, you have to weigh it out because there are pros and cons. Mm -hmm. But for me, wearing an estrogen patch on my butt has changed my life. And you're gonna have to pry it away from my cold, dead hands. Because <laughs> Because I can do anything now. I mean, my body can move again and I and I don't feel pain. And it's just, I have a new lease on life. But there were many, many years where I was couch bound. Wow. Yeah. And I hear that a lot. You know, people talking about hormone therapy and why they don't want to do it and this and that. And I think that it's not for everybody, just like you said, but it has come a long way. Mm -hmm. Right. From when you used to hear these stories about women getting sicker or breast cancer or just a number of other things, it is done differently. It has advanced. Well, now they also use bioidentical hormones. They yeah. used to use hormones they got from horse urine. Right. That was a little slightly different. You were getting horse estrus, which was a little bit of a different animal. Now you're getting bioidentical human estrogen. So it is, they can control the dose much better. And they, mm. you know, I mean, listen, you still risk breast cancer and other reproductive cancers. That's one of the things that's an increased risk along with blood clots. I mean, there are side effects right. and just like there are with antidepressants and cholesterol drugs and just about, you know, aspirin, even anything. You right. Take, exactly. Yeah. Ibuprofen. Right. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. excessive bleeding. Yeah. Oh, so you yeah. have to think about, so, you know, mags in my stance on medication is it can be a great tool for anything. Just know what you're taking and why. Right. Really be a good consumer. Ask your prescriber questions. Absolutely. Why this particular drug? What are the side effects that I can expect? What is the benefit of me having this versus the risk? In other words, you know, really being an informed consumer. And I think that Abby learned um, and I learned through her is that even if you create OBG again, right? They often do not know a lot about yeah. menopause. And so really finding a doctor that there's something called NAMS, like N-A-M-S, mm -hmm. and um, they have a website and they have doctors who've been trained in menopause, but finding doesn't have to be through there, but finding a doctor yeah. who's trained in menopause issues, because I think, you know, a lot of us stick with our OBGYNs if we've had one you know, and they miss a lot. Yeah. Their focus is more the obstetrics part. Right. So they are, you know, they're, my obstetrician, whom I adored, totally screwed me up when it came to my menopause. Like he missed it all. And it ended up costing me, but he, you know, he didn't do anything wrong. He was delivering 300 babies a year. Right. That was, his focus was on babies. It wasn't on estradiol and progesterone and what's going on in the female body when you go through menopause. That wasn't his area of expertise. So I think that is across the board when it comes to medicine. You know, it's not a one stop shop. Yes. Yes. Right. So depending on what's going on with your body, you need to see someone that specializes, was educated in that right down to the fact that and you'll hear a lot of doctors talk about about it now, they weren't trained on the dietary part of medicine and holistic and stuff like that. We're starting to see more and more doctors now because they get it. But before you didn't have that. So you still have to look out for that too and be advocate. I think it's more or less be an advocate for yourself, right? Yes. Yeah. And it's really hard. It's hard in today's medical system with insurance and yeah. you know, everything else. It's really, really hard sometimes to, you know, say I need a different doctor. Um, there's so many challenges to that, but it really can mean the difference between a lot of suffering and some help. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Ladies, let's talk a little bit about vitamins. Sure. So we love vitamins. To start that off. Yeah. Vitamins are good for you. Don't overdo <laughs> it. But vitamins are good for you. I mean, I think like 
I'm not saying go out there and just buy every vitamin on the shelf and start eating them like chiclets or something like that. You need to know what it is that you're putting in your body. But with the foods today, Mm -hmm. they are, you know, by the time we actually get them, they're already dying. They're depleted of nutrients and stuff like that. So we have to have some type of supplements. We're staying in the house because of COVID vitamin D, depending on where you live in the country, you know what I'm saying? You're not getting that sunshine. So there are other things that we need to do, but how can vitamins help with anxiety? Or can it help with anxiety and depression? Well, there are some vitamins that are particularly related to our moods and our mental health. So the first one is easy to remember. It's B, the brain vitamin. Okay, Mm -hmm. particularly B12. Yes. So, and as we get older, our B12 starts to taper off too, just like our estrogen does. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to make sure that you have, you're getting enough B12 Also, really important to know that you're getting enough folate, enough folic acid. Right. Really important. These vitamins support brain health. And they have done study after study that shows there is a direct correlation between a deficiency in the B vitamins and depression and anxiety and memory loss. Mm. So for all things, check your B levels. I mean, I take vitamin B12 under my tongue every day of my life. And if you happen to be a vegetarian or a vegan, definitely one. I mean, that's wonderful, but check your levels because especially if you're vegan, if you're not eating protein, animal proteins, it's very hard to get enough B12. Yeah. Plant protein. So I would say all vegans should take a B12 supplement because you're not getting the proteins you need. Like, unfortunately for vegans, the best source of B12 would be animal fats that you'll find in red meat and poultry and and eggs and that kind of stuff. So, So the B vitamins, super, super important. Then the other one that's really, really major, and when you referred to our nutrients being depleted, you are so right. The soil that grows our crops now. Yeah. It's nothing like the soil of when we were kids. Right. Right. Well, our mean, parents for that matter. Oh yeah. yeah. But even when yeah. the three of us were kids, because we're all the same age. So when the right. three of us were kids, we had much more magnesium mm. in our foods. Okay. Now it's very hard for anyone to get enough magnesium no matter what you eat. So taking a magnesium supplement is a fantastic idea, particularly if you have sleep issues. Because okay. magne- magnesium helps us regulate our sleep. And it totally, you can trace a magnesium deficiency and correlate it directly with anxiety in the science. Oh, wow. Okay. So if you're only going to do two things, I would say, if, like you said, vitamin D is so important for so many reasons. So yes, check that out. Yeah. Check those levels too. It's a really easy blood test. Like when you go to your annual checkup or whatever, just, you know, it, I think the vitamin D test is not even 20 bucks. So right. and insurance should cover it. But, yeah. you know, it's the kind of thing where if you're a woman, especially you want to know what your D levels are. It's really important because that's an easy supplement to take. But other than D, I would say B vitamins, particularly folate and 12, B12, and then also magnesium. Yeah, mm-hmm. I have been deficient in both. Mm. Mm. Um, with the B12, I had to get the injections for a year. Me too. Yeah, Abby did too. My arms hurt so bad. I know. (laughs) It was just like, oh my God. And it happened because I decided that I was no longer going to eat red meat. Mm -hmm. And I was not substituting with like any additional beans or lentils or, you know, anything else. And my body was just like, oh, that's what you're going to do? So, okay. But you know what's sad, Sharon, is that even if you were still eating red meat and you wouldn't, wouldn't that you wouldn't, it wouldn't be enough because yeah. really, uh, I was listening to a, a doctor talk the other day on, on a YouTube channel that I follow. And he said that it used to be that about half the people in the world were magnesium deficient. Now it's 80%. It's oh, wow. our, because our soil is so depleted. Mm-hmm. You know, our soil is not what it used to be. It isn't. Yeah. Yeah, the, the 1980s really changed a lot of our food systems um, with the sort of farm subsidy bills and all mm-hmm. that. Okay. Like 
You know, a neurologist pointed out to me one day that in the 70s, you know, when we would go to McDonald's, which was on occasion in my family, she said, well, think about it. You were eating grass fed beef because that's the only thing there was. Right. Now, you know, you go to McDonald's and you eat a burger and it's all corn fed. Yeah. I mean, if that. Whatever else. Whatever else. And so she was saying like that has changed our water. That's changed our soil. That's changed all the different fruit products we eat. So it the the 1980s were a real demarcation in terms of, you know, what was happening environmentally to our food sources and our water sources. And a um, lot of the poorer communities in this country got hit worse than anybody because, you know, oh, we, they got the most yeah. chemicals. So if you're listening, yes, magnesium, take it, magnesium glycinate. That's the one you want. And is there a certain amount of uh, milligrams or something like that? You can Google it. I mean, the only precaution I would say with magnesium is that it also relaxes your stomach muscles and your your enteric system. So if pooping is something that comes easily to you, you might want to start real low because it will help that. And if you're... But it'll help me, you know, if I flush out, I'll flush out some fat cells too, because I've been in here since covid you know, <laughs> <laughs> and we pass the it whole. Can, it can have a laxative effect. So Ooh, if, if you're going to be home, then yeah. you know, do it up. But if, <laughs> but if you're planning to leave the house that day, then start oh. slow. Start <laughs> slow and go slow, so that you can see what your body can handle. I'm one of those women that, you know, lucky me. Just everything makes me poop. So. Okay. <laughs> 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 Let's talk about it. You got to go. You need to go. You got to remove that. You can't have that sitting in there. You know what I mean? So listen, it's a conversation to be had. If I don't go to the bathroom regularly, my head hurts. And yeah. I, I'm like, is that really happening? Or that's just a signal from my body. You know, mm-hmm. something is not right. You know, th- these things are because actually you're supposed to what? After every time that you eat or at least three times a day or something like that, you're supposed to go. What goes in is supposed to come out. Right. Very, very few people do three times a day. I think that's, you know, you have to I think when you have an anxious stomach like me, it's a little easier to go a couple times a day. But I think that generally speaking, you know, you want to try to most days go. Yeah. If you can. I mean, you know, I mean, some people can go a little longer, but. You know, yeah, you want when you're eliminating stuff, it means that you're cleaning everything out. So, you know, it's a good idea. It's a good idea to clean out. And, you know, sometimes all you just need to do is drink a little more water. Exactly. (laughs) Or I could just have my mom call you guys and she's just going to ask, did you have a BM? Today, oh, my grandmother did that to me always. She would say, What shape was it? Was it the right? I'm in my 40s. I'm not telling you about my poop. But they knew it yeah. made a difference because the yeah. shape, the texture, the color, everything yeah. does make a difference. That's a whole nother show. And yes. we'll get to that later because we was about to go off track. We could talk about it, but yes. I really. Want- well, it is related to anxiety because anxiety, you know, in our gut, that's think about it. Right. That's where we feel anxiety for a lot of us is in our stomach. So it's very common as a symptom of anxiety to either or have a loose stool. Those are both right. very common. So gotcha. there's that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. What is the difference between um, anxiety and stress? In certain ways, there's not a big difference at times. Usually, you know, there's a cue on stress, like you're stressed about money or you're stressed about a deadline or you're stressed about, you know, a certain situation in your life. And anxiety sometimes, as you said, doesn't have a cue. Sometimes it does, like you're mm-hmm. you're afraid to drive on a bridge, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you're talking on the phone right. and you have panic. But one thing that we know is that chronic stress actually changes as we're talking about the hormones in your body, right? And chronic stress actually does lead to anxiety. Chronic stress can be like walking through the world, being someone who's discriminated against, Mm -hmm. you know, someone who's not safe, someone who any kind of discrimination um, or racism that can cause chronic stress. And when you're under that long enough, your body is sending out those fight, flight and freeze hormones and it becomes anxiety. So, you know, obviously everyone feels stress from time to time. We all feel like, Oh, I have to get this done or that done. But that, that's sort of chronic. Those like 
like sort of of doses of chronic stress, you know, that can very easily lead to an anxiety disorder unless, um, even if, but unless we're managing that very carefully. Well, let's talk about that. Um, Can you give us some techniques on managing it? I talked about breathing exercises. Awesome. That Okay. I was going to say, because that That really did help me. That was incredible. And for some people, breathing is something that really works. We have a lot of breathing exercises in our book. And for other people, when they're really having a lot of panic, um, breathing for me, when I was having a lot of panic, breathing wasn't that helpful okay. to hyperventilate. I've learned over the years how to use breathing more effectively. So there's a lot of different techniques. One we really love is we call it um, a spin kit. And we sort of say that it's a first aid kit for anxiety. And what is that? Explain you want to explain now? So you want me to? Sure, sure. So, well, first of all, you're probably wondering why we call it a spin kit. Because for me and Mags, when we see the word panic, we think it's a command. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we've talked to so many, you know, anxiety sufferers who've agreed with us that, you know, the word anxiety or the term panic attack, those are anxiety provoking words. Okay. And human beings, we tend to, the way we communicate our experience is how we feel about it. So if we're calling something panic, it's, it's going right. to make it Makes more sense. Panic. Yeah. So yeah. we decided to call it spinning. Okay. Because we figured number one, it's a really good metaphor because it feels like you're spinning, right? Yeah. You feel like you're, you know, and we call our podcast the spin cycle because okay. we feel like anxiety is very much like being in that particular cycle of the wash, right? You're, you know, you come out disoriented and dizzy and drenched, you know, and so it's it's very much a good metaphor. Also a good metaphor because like a top that spins, eventually the spinning stops. Right. And that's the thing about anxiety. It doesn't feel like it will let you go, but it always it really lets you go. You know. So we're big fans of riding the wave while while it's got you and until it lets you go and not fighting it, but doing things like, for example, the breathing exercises or carrying a spin kit or other things to keep you busy while you're spinning but to not fight it. So what would be in a spin kit? Okay, so a spin kit would have uh, symptom relief. So if let's just say you get headaches when you get anxiety, so maybe you'd wanna have Tylenol or Advil or something like that. If you're a stomach sufferer, then maybe you'd want Gas X or Tums or ginger tea or peppermint, something that would be soothing for the stomach. If you take a sedative, you might want to carry that with you. Whatever symptoms you experience with anxiety, you wanna keep some of that in your kit. You also wanna keep something to distract you. And so you want something that will keep you busy enough, but not so, you know, something that would require so much attention that you couldn't possibly do it. Like most people can't read a book when they're in the midst of anxiety. That requires too much concentration or they can't do a crossword puzzle, but maybe they could color or maybe they could play with a fidget spinner or Maggie doesn't go anywhere without her crochet needles. She gotcha. likes to crochet everywhere. That keeps her hands busy. And it's it's sort of repetitious enough for her that she doesn't have to focus so hard and concentrate so much mm-hmm. on it. So some kind of distractor. And then finally, we want something that's going to both soothe and ground our senses. Okay. Because when we're experiencing anxiety, our senses tend to go, whoo, right? <laughs> Every, you know, everything becomes hypervigilant. Mm-hmm. So we might be sensitive to smells and sounds and lights or, or, the t- or the touch or texture of something. Right. Like sometimes when you're anxious and you're wearing something, it starts to bother you and you start doing this, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? So we suggest carrying in your spin kit some things to soothe your senses and keep you grounded. And that could be, um, let's say, an aroma that you like, maybe lavender or peppermint or cinnamon. Or anything yeah. you can sniff that kind of will take you, you know, kind of bring you back to your, your body and also help distract you and soothe your senses a little bit or noise canceling headphones are great to carry with you so that if you, if noises get too loud for you, you can put the headphones on. Um, you know, uh, also like I, I'm a very tactile person. So I carry Douglas, the chicken with me in my spin kit. He's a little stuffed chicken this big. Okay. Got that rabbit fur feeling. Remember when oh, we were kids, we had those soft. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Super, super soft. And so I, I literally, I'm 54 years old and I play with a stuffed chicken, but let me tell you what, it's very soothing. Gotcha. And so I'm stroking my chicken. And that doesn't <laughs> I'm stroking my, my stuffed chicken. <laughs> 
It's it's just a, stroke on my sister as long as it works. That's right. right. Stroke that's on. Right. And right. then and then something like that you can taste sometimes is very grounding, like a very strong mint. People okay. like coconut, something that will just get you back in your body. You know how sometimes when you're very anxious, it can be very discombobulating. Mm. We can feel like we're sort of floating. So we want to be able to get back and get grounded a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Some, people, some people wear or keep a rubber band with them that they could okay. kind of the snapping. The rest and snap yeah. it. Yeah. You know what the best part of a spin kit is? What? The best part of a spin kit is that by carrying it with you, you are prepared. For mm. So let me just tell you this. The worst part of anxiety, the most insidious part of having anxiety disorder is that feeling when you start to feel that anxiety of why is this happening? I'm minding my own business. I'm standing here in the grocery store. Why, why is my heart racing? I'm just minding my own business, driving my car like I love to do. Why is my heart thudding? My stomach is killing me and I'm, you know, I'm in the carpool line. Why? All, that's the first thing that happens is we go to the why. Mm -hmm. This must mean there's something wrong with my heart or something's wrong with my stomach or something. I have this or that. That's where we go. And that tends to turn into a feedback loop. Right. So what we're paying attention to grows. So our symptoms get bigger and bigger. And then we're feeling them and asking more and more questions. And we're, and we're growing the whole thing. When you have a spin kit with you, that's not the first thing that you're going to say is why. The first thing you're going to say is, oh, okay, I have a spin kit to take care of this. Right, right. I'm so there's, I'm no, ready. there's no sneak attack. Gotcha. And that is going to take so much of the oomph out of the anxiety. That I mean, for me, it took away 50% of the oomph. Because mm. I, you know, I didn't have to sit there and try to figure out why I was. What am I going to do? Yeah. What right? What am I going to do? I was ready, right? right. Because we yeah. often can't think during mm -hmm. when we're having a panic attack. That that sort of rational thinking part is not working so well. So having something on the ready to do is very helpful. You can just sort of pull it out. Yeah. Nice. Wow, this is great. Great, great, great. All right. Um, what is? Oh, I'll tell us about the. Home. There's Sorry. three steps to, um, sure, approach the uh, riding the wave, but go ahead. I'm sorry. Mike. I, I ahead. just wanted to say one more, one more thing. Um, we say this for everybody. And then I think this is really important for people who are dealing with a lot of racism or discrimination. Um, we always say community is something, and we will talk about that in a minute, but it's something that's very, very healing. Yeah. Having a support system, having community, having safe places to go. And I think when you're under that kind of chronic stress of discrimination or racism or anything, it becomes even more crucial yeah. to have those connections and those safe spaces. Um, that yes, that may not help you in the minute with a panic attack, but that is going to help your overall, right. our overall mental right. health yeah. for everyone. And how to, to maybe even, you know, not cause you to be as yes. stressful because you know, you're not alone. You have somebody that you can reach out to, um, you can talk to and, you know, um, right down to at our age, ageism. Yes, right? because we have to deal with those discriminations, right? And and the language that we use in reference to um, people of a older age or community, right? So I agree with you on that 100%. Um, I didn't speak much about this because we are doing the podcast, but I am also a certified holistic health and wellness coach. And I work with women that are 50 and older, but it's about building community, right? Yes. It's also about accountability. So I am an accountability coach because a lot of times there's so many things that we want to do. We, we know we want to do our goals and things, but we don't get there because we don't have that support system. And support is needed in everything that you do, one form or another. We're wired for connection. Human yeah. beings are social animals, right? We have these things called mirror neurons, which are designed to help us connect with one another, right? So like if you smile at me mm -hmm. or I smile at you, you're going to smile back because those, that's mirror neurons at work, right? Okay. Or that's why we sometimes will imitate someone that we've been, like right. if we're spending time with someone who has a particular accent or a particular way of speaking, we end up imitating it without trying to. 
these are our mirror neurons at work. So that's scientific proof that we are designed to connect with one another. And when we are isolated from one another, yeah. and we can't connect, like let's say what would happen in a worldwide pandemic situation, yeah. that affects everyone's <laughs> health. I mean, it yeah. does. It's not surprising to me and Mags at all that they're coming out with all these studies now about how damaged all of us are. Yeah. Our health, you know, be it that the pandemic ended up being so unhealthy for us in so many ways beyond just COVID, which was in itself horrible. Exactly. But beyond that, I mean, our mental health suffered so much. And one of the reasons was because we were not connected with one another as well. Yeah. You know, and we it's, all yeah. it's all ages. Yeah. It's all ages that are both. suffering from that. You I, know? I mean, I, yes, I was telling Abby that my mother-in-law, who's been in a nurse, and not a nurse, she's in an assisted living mm-hmm place, but she has uh, dementia and listening to her during the pandemic, when my husband would go visit her, he would, he would say, come home and say to me, I think she is, I think this is it. I think we're, we're done. Like she's going to die soon, literally. And as soon as they started opening up the dining room again, doing some activities again, yeah, she is a new person. Uh-huh. I mean, she's has a new life and it's like, just watching that is is so interesting because it's like seeing that whole idea of that isolation, how dangerous it is for all yeah, of us. Absolutely. You are so right. So, so right. Oh, my goodness. But you know what? That's why we're having these conversations. Right. And that's yeah. why we're going to continue yes. to have these conversations and reach as many people as we possibly can. We may be talking about different things, but I think together, some way or another, it's all heading in the same direction. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about health and wellness, anxiety, you know, depression, all this it, is still a part of becoming a healthy society. Right. Um, I do talk a lot about healing and being whole because there's a difference. And a lot of people don't know that. You know what I'm saying? So Mm. I'm glad we have the opportunity to talk about this. I really would love to have you ladies back on again because we could talk for hours upon hours. That means that I got to upgrade. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) So we don't keep getting cut off, but is there anything that you would like to share with the audience real quick? I, I mean, I know you have a lot to share and there was so much in this book that I really wanted to talk about. But again, I'm thankful that you were able to come on now and we just began to get this started, right? We'll meet up again, you know, and continue with the conversation right. because I know that this is a topic that is definitely needed. So Abby, is there anything additional that you would like to offer to the audience? And then Max, you can go. I want to tell your listeners that if you think that you might be experiencing anxiety and or depression, you are not alone and you can feel better and more hopeful and more connected. So come to Anxiety Sisters. It's free. We have a worldwide community of 220,000 people and they are the kindest, most supportive, gentlest people who really understand anxiety on all levels. We are open to all genders, all levels. (laughs) So even if you just get butterflies in your stomach, you'll fit in or all the way up to if you can't leave your home, you'll fit right in. So don't suffer alone. Join us. Come to us and and be part of our our community. Wow. Thank Mm -hmm. you. That is awesome. What about you, Max? I think, you know, in this in this time, I think probably every time, um, you know, something Abs and I talk about a lot is the side self passion. And so if you're listening to this, anyone that, you know, as women, we are pretty self and we definitely take in all the things that our culture says to us about women in midlife. And we take in the stuff that we heard in our families and sometimes the stuff we hear at work or out in the world. And we are our own worst critics. We take uh-huh. those voices and we yell at ourselves. Yeah. And when we that ourselves into fight, flight, or fight often when we're yelling at her. Um, so we send ourselves in really taking the time to speak to yourself uh-huh as you were close friend, because you would not yell at close friend. You, you know, in most cases, you would understand that everyone struggles, you know, and that's part of life. And so 
just adding that bit of self-compassion, starting to be cognizant of it can be a really life-changing step for all of us. I agree 100%. We need to speak love and life over ourselves. You know, we find it easy to do it for others, but we need to do that for ourselves, right? How would they join you? How would they contact you? Anxietysisters.com is our website. And we want to tell you there's a panic button on our website on the top corner of every page. And if you are feeling very anxious and you would like for to sit with a recording of me for six or seven minutes, <laughs> then push that button. We don't know who pushes it. We just know that it gets pushed 1500 times a week. Nice. So, so that's available to you. You can push it as many times as you want to. Um, and that way, if, especially if you're alone and you're feeling okay. anxious, then you won't be so alone. So anxietysisters.com, there's lots of resources, blogs. Uh, you can access our podcast on there. Anywhere you get your podcasts, we are the spin cycle with the Anxiety Sisters. And we do this very thing. We sit and we chat with people about anxiety and everything else that goes with it. You can find us on Facebook at Anxiety Sisters. We have a very active Facebook page that we moderate all the time. So it's a really safe, gentle space. And we're on Instagram at the Anxiety Sisters. And are we anywhere else, Max? We're sort of on Twitter, but not really on Twitter. I yeah, mean, me I don't know if it really counts. But you know what? You can <laughs> also, you can email us at abs and mags at anxietysisters.com. Okay. And we do answer every email or you can direct message us on Facebook. And we we really try to answer every single email. It sometimes takes us a few days, but, um, you know, feel free to shoot us an email or direct message us. Okay, audience, you heard that. They are here. They are a support system. They're waiting for you. You know, go to the site, check it out. Refer the information back to someone that you know that it can help as well. That's what we're doing. We are creating support systems and you should be a part of creating a support system as well because everybody needs one. Ladies, thank you so much for joining me this evening. Thank you for providing this information for the listeners. But before Before we go, if you were a color, what color would you be? Abs. Oh, I guess I'd be some form of red. Okay. Why red? That's, woo, caution. (laughs) Wait, wait. I'm fiery, you know? Ah! And I have red, I have the Leo. Yeah, Yeah, the Leo, and I have the red hair. You know. Gotcha. Red, red, I would think. All right. What about you, Max? <laughs> um, I would be some form of pink. Oh, well, I'm pink. a girly girl. You know, I'm a. <laughs> I'm you know what? I know you are because you were like, okay, okay, with the hair, and then you put it back, and then you. Oh, it oh, I yeah, okay. that it needs to be cut, and it has. <laughs> but I, I am a, I am a, you know, I'm sort of all girl. Gotcha. Yes, she's always putting her lipstick on. It's very cute. Yeah, I'm all. <laughs> boy, I, I, I definitely would with that. Yeah, (laughs) nothing wrong with that. If I was a color, I would be turquoise. (gasps) Turquoise is my favorite color. It just reminds me of of life living because it's a combination of the green and 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 blues, which is like water flowing. And that's why that's where I am. And like that, that's how I feel. I'm here. I'm there. I'm, you know. Hey. Oh, we didn't talk. One second. We got to hurry up. Music. I read in a book about music. Let me tell you something. When I read that, I was like, yes, because music is so freeing. You yeah. know what I mean? Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this type of music, but it's called house music. Yes. OK. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm what I'm, I'm a house head. That's what it's called. Okay. Right. I'm a house head. I throw my music on. I get my dance on for 45 minutes um, to tell you the truth. Wherever there's music playing, I kind of forget about everybody else. My kids be like, you know, you in the supermarket, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I just love it. So I really loved what you were talking about in reference to music. So sometimes when you're feeling stressed or going through, throw on some music and vibe on it and let it take you there i i truly truly believe in that but again i am gonna have you to come back on so we can finish the conversation i am so thankful and grateful for you guys for joining unapologetic at 50 i want to wish 
both of you a happy birthday if I don't talk to you before then, but we are in this together. Whenever you need me or you need my audience, feel free because now you are a part of the family. Thank oh, you for joining thank us. You. <laughs> we love talking with you. And yeah, you're great. awesome. Great. You're awesome. And you guys are too. So thank you. And I'll be talking to you soon. Okay. Love that. Okay. Stay well. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Unapologetic at 50. Together, we will learn how to maneuver life's challenges while being our authentic selves without regret. Remember to subscribe to Unapologetic at 50 to be notified of new episodes. Don't be salty with me if you are the last to know. And never apologize for being the best version of you.